morning, guys. I'm so excited that we're here together again uh, to worship the Lord. And today's going to be a special day. Um, my name is Robin. I'm an associate pastor here at Redemption Church. And I'm just glad that you've decided to join us today. Um, I can't wait until we can get back together at some point to uh, be able to worship together. Uh, hug each other and uh, be able to celebrate the things that God continues to do in our lives. Uh, but in the meantime, praise God for um, online church and just that we can continue to worship the Lord uh, in the midst of it all. So I'm so thankful for that. And uh, today, uh, at the end of the service, we are going to take a special time of communion. And I'm really excited about that. It seems like it's been a little while. Uh, when we meet together, we do it every week. And I kind of miss that. And I imagine you are too. So I'm excited about doing communion together with you at the end of the service. So prepare your hearts and make sure you get some elements and stuff ready so that we can do that today. Enjoy the worship. Well, good morning, everyone. Glad to be worshiping with you once again, and we are going to have some fun this morning. Let's worship the Lord together. this morning and worship your name and Lord we want to do that in spirit and truth we want to realize how good you are I thank you so much for gathering mm -hmm. us this morning God I thank you so much for being with mm -hmm. us and we want to cast our mind upon you Lord our eyes and fix them on you and your grace and your goodness we pray Lord for the distractions right now Lord we pray that our hearts will be in tune to your heart that we would run to you God that we would look to you and seek you God we just thank you so much of how you're working, how you're moving. Lord, we just continue to pray that you would be our focus in these times of uncertainty and knowing what's going on, Lord. I pray that we would know and be reminded by your spirit of who you are. So we love you, Lord. You deserve all of our praise. And we just come to you now this morning, God, to worship your name. I wasn't created to 
buried alone I hear your invitation To let it all go Why see it now? I'm laying it down And I know that I
thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you that we can find our joy in you, that we could take time this morning to sing, to study your word, your promises, Lord, that we can claim these promises to be truth, Lord. We can see you working all over our world. God, what the enemy intended for evil, you can use for good. And so we say in this moment, Lord, uh, have your way. Uh, conform us to the image of your Son, Father. We want to run to you in these moments of uncertainty and run to you, God, to your goodness, to your word. So speak to us, Holy Spirit. We come to you together, Lord, by your sacrifice that you paid, God. We come to you together from your heart, your family. You gather us, God. And so I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be unified, that we would be bonded together in this service as we come together to sing your praises, to study your word, to take communion, to enjoy fellowship with you, God. We love you. We thank you so much for all that you're doing, how you're working. And we pray you continue to be glorified in and through us. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, here are your announcements. Wow, it's awesome to worship the Lord together, um, even virtually uh, in our homes as we continue to worship the Lord. Um, God has called us to worship Him in so many ways, and I'm so thankful for this church at Redemption and just the amazing things that we get to be a part of, so many outreaches and things, and that's all because of the way that God continues to use each of you guys. Um, through your giving. So I just want to encourage you to continue to give. Um, it's another act of worship that, that God calls us to. Just continue to give in your tithes and offerings as we go through this pandemic. Um, and let's continue to see what God wants to do with Redemption Church. So uh, let's continue worshiping the Lord as we get into His Word. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that, um, Lord, you've already gone before us, Lord, and you've uh, prepared your word for our hearts, Lord. And now we ask you, as we sit and we listen to the message, that you would prepare our hearts to receive you, Lord, that you would just continue to grow us, challenge us, Lord, encourage us, and um, just, Lord, fill us with more of who you are. Thank you, Jesus. We love you and we praise you. Help us to worship you as we listen to your word in your name. Amen. Amen. Enjoy the word. You're listening to the Redemption Church Podcast as we go through a study of the book of Revelation called The Majesty of Jesus. Well, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That is exactly what we are doing as a community, trying to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us through God's Word this morning. And so, uh, man, I am so excited that you're here with us. If I have not met you, I want to personally introduce myself. My name is Daniel Williams. I'm the lead pastor here at Redemption Church, and I love studying God's Word with you, uh, being able to worship Jesus. And that's what we're doing. Like Pastor Robin said, we are worshiping Jesus 
uh, through God's word, looking to his kingdom and looking to what he wants for our lives today. And I believe that when we do this together, uh, whether it be an online platform, in person, a podcast, we are actually blessed because Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. See, it's not bad to seek other things or use our time for other stuff in this world, but first we need to seek Jesus. Put him in his rightful place that he is preeminent and worship him and give him our lives. And when we do that, we're going to see great fruit. So that's why I'm so glad that you're here, that you're studying God's word with us today. Uh, and so we're going to continue our study through the book of Revelation uh, in a series called The Majesty of Jesus. We are looking at how great Jesus is through the word of God. And we find ourselves studying seven letters written by Jesus to the churches in Asia Minor. And although uh, they were written to specifically to people that are going through specific things in that culture. These churches and these writings apply to us today. Again, he who has an ear was something that uh, after every single time the letter was written, whether it be from in Ephesus, Pergamum, Smyrna, like it would always say, he who has an ear, let him hear what the church says to or what the spirit says to the churches. And so these things are written to a specific church in a specific time, but it's plural and applies to us as God's church. So we find in Revelation 1.19 this divine outline that states right now we live in the age of the church, that Jesus is alive and active and His Spirit is moving in people like me and you. And so we go to God's Word to look to see how to walk in His kingdom by faith, and these things apply to us right here, right now. Now, I love what J. Hampton Keeley III said, chapters two and three contain seven messages that are extremely practical for us today on a personal and corporate level. And so we don't want to rush through this. I didn't want to rush through this uh, and just get to the prophecy and, the, and chapter four and just go on and all this different stuff. No, no, we need to embrace what Jesus has to say to us. And so today we're going to be covering the third church mentioned in this seven um, churches that are clustered in this uh, part of the letter of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. We've already looked at Ephesus, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Smyrna, uh, the suffering church, chapters chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Uh, and so Ephesus was the backsliding church. Smyrna was the suffering church. Uh, we're going to look today at uh, Pergamos, the, the worldly church. And I think we have a lot to learn from this church. I've been trying to do two churches a week, but I had so much. Uh, and sp- Plus with communion, we're just going to do this one church, and I think we can grow and learn a lot. And so let's look together at this text. Uh, let's read together in chapter 2, verse 12, uh, through... Um, 17. It says this, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But, verse 14 says, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold a teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might uh, that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of Nicolaitans. Now we've mentioned Nicolaitans. Nicotolians, I keep on wanting to say Nickelodeons, but that's not the case, uh, but this group of teaching. And if you remember when we looked last week in the church of Ephesus, they actually rebuked this group for teaching. This word literally means, um, it merely means conquered to conquer people. And that's what they were doing. They were oppressing people, having different class systems, having priest and laity and different groups uh, for their own pleasure and oppressing other people. And sad to say, but it must be said, even in our culture today in America and in the world, there are still people today that we our hearts are breaking that are being oppressed, that God loves everyone. And we see the reality of sin when people try to be above 
one another or a certain class rises up, a majority or a minor group, whatever it may be. And God doesn't want this, okay? We're going to look more into that a little bit later as we look through the text. But I just want to encourage you, as your heart breaks, as you see the news and, and even the racism going on in America and in the world today, that God is for all people. That this isn't biblical because every tribe, tongue, and nation will be in heaven. And God loves all races, all cultures, all people. And this is why in verse 16, in response to this uh, satanic teaching, okay, it says, Therefore, repent. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Meaning God will enforce justice and make every wrong right in his eternal kingdom and he still will make every wrong right for those that oppress another people group are this type of false teaching he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to the one who conquers i will give some of the hidden manna and i will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it all right, so there's a couple of verses for you. We're going to look and just look starting at the context of the book and the context of the city. Okay, this is the third church addressed. Uh, it was the church of Pergamum or uh, Pergamos. Okay, this was only about 20 miles away from Smyrna, the church that we looked at last week. Remember, there's a group of a cluster of churches in, in uh, modern day Turkey that uh, Jesus is addressing and telling John to write to these churches. And as we move through these seven churches, we start to see different issues, different strengths, different weaknesses, different uh, rebukes, different um, commendations. Um, even though they were in a close region, in the, this region of Asia Minor, they were still seven unique congregations and differences. And I would argue this, that was a okay, good thing. That we see, we starting to see the differences as we study more of the books. Uh, many people say, well, why don't we just all just join and be one church? If we're, we're in one city, one community, one region, let's just have this large church and do everything together. We're in the same region. Well, one of the reasons why this does not take place is because it's not a part of God's plan. God has specifically set up certain local leadership and calling and, and ministry of philosophy and the way people see things and gifts and, and members in different assemblies or local congregations. And I mentioned this uh, this last week in the bonus content podcast on episode seven, talking about the importance of walking in unity and in love. And this week uh, in the bonus podcast, I'm going to uh, release another episode called the importance of receiving revelation in community. Community is an important aspect of seeing God's heart and His character because it reveals more about Him. God is able to give an answer to many problems in all these different churches because that's how beautiful and big He is. And He makes a variety of of people and issues and problems he can face and deal, but he also gives gifts and local congregations to not just come together in one gathering, but to come together in unity and come together in love. And so as we live in community as an individual member or as a church family in the body of Christ, we start to realize the beauty of the capital C church and the great value of community because we're seeing each church that Jesus is addressing, these seven churches, there are different um, highlights. There are different issues. There's things going on. And so we're starting to see the, the great uh, beauty of even the Lord because He's able to deal with all of these things going on. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 says, For the body does not consist of one member, but many. It goes on to say, the eye, has not say uh, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. See, I believe that we are truly better together and when we play our individual part in the body of Christ. It's not just a hand, it's not just a ear, it's not just a foot. It's us coming together and we see the beauty of the body of Christ, the capital C Church, because we are all a part of God's body, one baptism, one Lord, one Savior, as we put our faith in Jesus. And so just as the body supports one another, we're to support one another. And there is this cluster of seven churches in this region that were actually supporting one another, getting encouragement from one another, and Jesus was addressing all of them. I like what John Corson said about this area, or this region, this, this idea. Uh, he says, the Christian walk is about togetherness, community. It is all about being a holy nation, a corporate entity, because God is not into spiritual lone rangers. 
You know, that's why some of you guys are starting to get a little discouraged because we're not gathering together. You weren't made to be by yourself. You were made in the image of God, who is the perfect triune God, that there is community in the Godhead and he made us in our image and we're to have community. We're told not to forsake the fellowship of the brethren. And this is why it's so important to start getting together as, as the government allows, whether it be in a groups of 10 or less or eventually, hopefully in a large gathering setting. But I know that some of you are having watch parties and watching it with families and, and, and friends and, and just having fellowship, dinners and communion and prayer. This is important for our walk with Jesus. And we're seeing this right here in the church. Uh, Pergamos, only 20 miles away from Smyrna. Okay, And so this city, Pergamos, is, uh, I think it's modern day Cyprus around there. And it's a part of this cluster of churches in the same region. And it was very wealthy like Smyrna. Right, um, but it was it was primarily known in that region more for its wickedness. Uh, it, it was extremely religious city and incorporated many false re, uh, religions into the way of life in that city. Uh, it had temples for the Greek gods, the Roman gods. It also had three different dedicated temples to worship. Roman emperors just in that city. They did a lot of mixing of religion um, in that city. They mixed religion and politics together. They had a lot of compromise. Now, this was the political capital of the Roman providence of Asia in this area, and it had been so for about 300 years. A matter of fact, 50 years before Smyrna had built their first temple uh, to, to Tiberius, uh, the, 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 the city of Pergamos, man, they were like in it to win it and they actually um, instituted worship to Caesar. Remember Smyrna didn't bow down to the political emperor and didn't get that business certificate to do a lot of ministry. That's why they were poor. Well, these guys actually implemented it. They started it. Hey, let's 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 have religion and let's have politics and let's mesh those two together and let's live life that way. Or let's have religion and let's mesh that with health care and 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 health. Uh, see this this city was also known for um, a worship of a god, uh, Acapilius. I hope I'm saying that right, but if not, you probably don't know anyway. All right. The city was especially known for a center of worship of Acapilius, and the Acapilius was a god of medicine. So uh, to represent the god, there was this snake. Um, and you would go into the temple for healing and for knowledge. And actually in this temple, in the city, this major hub, there was a school of medicine. And so you had education, school, health, uh, all together in Pergamos with religious. In fact, because of this famous temple in the Rome, uh, to this Roman god of healing, sickness, and disease, people came from all over Roman Empire to flock there. So now you have tons of people from culture that necessarily wouldn't go to Ephesus or Smyrna or anything. They would go to here to find healing and have all these different uh, worships to this false god. And so they mixed health, they mixed politics with religion, they mixed health with religion, they mixed education. This place Place was known for knowledge because it was one of the capital places of uh, politics uh, they had a lot of temples and education and libraries in fact one commentator said the city was noted for um, for being a center of culture and education having one of the greatest libraries of the ancient world with more than 200,000 volumes I think my book collection is impressive this was like the Congress of Libraries, man. This is like uh, amazing. 200 volumes. They, uh, so they valued politics, knowledge, religion, education, and it was just all a big marriage. And literally, that's what this word means. Pergamos. It means to be married. The root word actually derives from where we get our English word uh, bigamy or polygamy, where we collect and mix and match and put things together. And this was just a way of life in the city. And so the very name of the city is again giving us a clue of the problem in the church, that there was some compromise, not only in the culture, but it creeped into the church. They had married their values, their lives, and their worship with some aspects of false teaching and the world. And the culture seemed to influence the church, which by the way, is never a good idea, because this church was married to false doctrines and practiced that the culture practices practiced some of the things that the culture embraced. And the Lord warns us against this condition. It's this idea of being unequally yoked. Uh, of compromising our beliefs and marrying ourselves or uh, yoking ourselves with unbelievers uh, as a way of life. In 1 Corinthians 6, 
14 through 16, it says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Now, this is talking about when you would put a yoke on an animal and one ox would go this way and, um, and you would put two yokes and just, you know, be able to um, be able to do a straight line and harvest things and be very fruitful. But if you had an animal going this way and a, and a yoke going that way and they were going the opposite ways, it wouldn't do any good. It would be hard for you to labor, to get anything done, uh, to be fruitful. And God is saying, like, listen, you, you can't be yoked to, to God who is true and worship Him and then also be yoked to, like, this false God and do pagan sacrifices. These things don't work. Um, or to put it sort of weird, polygamy doesn't work, okay? Uh, you were only made to worship one God, and there is only one true God, and God wants you to worship Him, not other false gods or what you think are gods, okay? And so the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked. It's, it goes on in this verse. It says, what accord uh, has Christ with Belial? Bili or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? You understand it's like oil and vinegar. It doesn't match. He goes on and says, For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so we look at this city and the culture and understanding there was this compromise uh, and there was this great mixing. And the Bible tells us not to do that with the things of the world, that we're to follow God wholeheartedly with everything we have. And so we look at the condition of the church and there were three serious problems that existed in the church of Pergamum that we could learn from today because they still exist in the church and in us today as we mix with world values and as we get tempted to become equally yoked with culture and what the world finds that's important and not what God sees as important. The first thing we see is they were surrounded by Satan's throne. Verse 13. Let me just tell you, this isn't good to be surrounded by Satan's throne. Yikes. But the reality is, isn't that our world today? 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says Satan is called the God of this age. And Jesus even acknowledges the danger and temptations of this world as Christians, followers of Him, living in this world. Matthew 10, 16 says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. In fact, Jesus prayed in John 17, 15, Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. See, but rather than being on guard, some of the church in Pergamum was not responding to these realities. They weren't striving for purity, and they compromised. And they gave in to the temptation and the sinful culture that surrounded them and embraced that as normal. Just as some people in the church today, they get unequally yoked, they compromise, or they're just not living in the reality that there is a God of this age, and there is temptation, there is a spiritual warfare going on. We cave into culture and get our cues from the world rather than God's Word. And that's not good. That's not okay. That's a problem. Chuck Swindoll said, Like erosion, worldly compromises can slowly, silently, and suddenly eat away at truth. And this is why the Bible warns you and I, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. The temptation is great and was great and will be great. There is temptation as we live in this broken world. And Jesus didn't want us to be of this world. He wanted to be heavenly minded, citizens of heaven, being about his kingdom. He taught us when we pray in Matthew 6, 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's like playing, uh, it's like that old saying, you can't play with fire and, and not get burned. Or what Proverbs 6, 27 says, can a man carry next uh, fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? You know, it reminds me a lot of how uh, people that have been close to God have compromised and it really has backfired and hurt them. I think about the man Lot, Abraham's nephew. He uh, was being blessed by the Lord, had so much land, and, and really Abraham and he had to split. And so uh, he looked at the land and said, oh, there's a great place by Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a lot of field for my servants and stuff. And so he went by over by the city. But eventually you see in Genesis 13 through 19, the story of Lot, that Lot 
starts to get pulled in by the culture. He starts to compromise. You see this in his story that that instead of just being in the field, then he moves into the city. Then all of a sudden, he's making decisions at the gate. He's a leader. He finally, uh, we see his family have the same values, marrying uh, women from there, uh, have the same values of like the city. And the, actually so much so that when God takes down Sodom and Gomorrah, he tells the whole family, don't look back. And Lot's wife looks back because her heart was pulled into the things of this world. And it cost her. Oftentimes, when we play with fire and compromise in our faith, we get burned. You know, oftentimes I try to illustrate this and and tell people it's a lot easier for someone to pull you down from a chair than to pull them up from a chair. You're gonna you're gonna fall many times. We think, well, we ju- we'll just go close and we'll we'll just go right by the liner. I'm gonna I'm gonna just bring people up to my level. The reality is is there's a great temptation, and if Satan's throne is all around us, we shouldn't play with fire. We need to resist the devil and he will flee. Submit to the Lord, resist the devil and he will flee. James says, and it's good for us not to be unequally yoked, playing with something that will cause us to strive away. From the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 33 says, Do not be deceived. Right? Isn't the enemy a liar? Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Proverbs 30, 13 uh, 20, a book of wisdom, uh, says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Like my dad always told me growing up, watch who you are hanging out with because these things matter. This church was not only hanging out in Satan's throne, but they embraced it and they thought it was normal, but not all of them. Jesus commends them and says, listen, just because you're around these things does not mean that you have to give in to these things, that you don't have to compromise in your faith. Listen, we're in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. And and he actually gives this church some, some encouragement in this text by the person of Anipus, who was a martyr. Now, this doesn't really seem encouraging because he died for his faith. But listen, He stood against the attacks of the evil one around him in the city and he did not compromise. Even though the whole culture was about compromise, even some people in the church compromised, Jesus says, but there was a person, Anipus, which actually lived up to his name because his name means against all. He stood against the culture and against Satan and stood for truth and lived out his faith in a society that was super hard to do because they'd mix religion with everything, education, health, uh, wealth, with politics. But he stood for the name of Jesus. And you know what? He shows us that we can actually stand against Satan in this life, that we, we can stand against his lies. Just because Satan is seeking to devour us, 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us, we actually can stand against him and we can stand against his temptations and we're not doomed in this life. Ephesians 6, 10 and 11 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Too often times we blame our compromise on sin or the flesh or culture. Yet it's so easy to play the victim card. God wants us to have strength and to walk in freedom, power, and victory and acknowledge our sin and compromise and just turn to Him. 1 John 9, 1 John 1, 9 verse 10 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. Instead of walking in the ways of the world, we need and can walk in the ways of the Spirit. And so we see some hope here in this problem that Jesus gives the answer and encouragement to. But the second thing we see is this. They embrace the doctrine of Balaam. They embrace the doctrine of Balaam. Verse 14. Now, Balaam was a false god, and Balak was a a hireling prophet, a false prophet who led the people of Israel into sin in return for wealth and prestige. And we actually can read about him in Numbers 22 through 25, a few chapters in the book of Numbers. Uh, He encouraged Israel to worship heathen idols, to eat food sacrifices to idols, to worship Balaam, and to indulge in fornication. Why would this false prophet do this? Well, to receive pleasures of this world, money, power, status. He's not the ideal example of a hero of faith. He's a false prophet. Yet, at Pergamos, 
The church was wedded to the world in order to get worldly advantages. They had compromised. They wanted the prestige, the wealth, the power, just like Balak, uh, Balak uh, pointing people to Balaam, and embraced this type of compromise for worldly pleasures. And this temptation is still strong in us today, even as believers. Paul warned Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. He warns the church, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is, the, it is through this craving and that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. We need to be careful not to compromise our character for money. We may not think about it that way or say it that blunt, but it's true. This is a huge thing for us because the spirit of mammon, possessions, money is a real false god in this world and it tempts us. It tempts us. Whether it be working too much to neglect and neglecting our family or maybe doing little white lies for sales to earn more money, obsessing over money and just pondering and worshiping and working for, for money rather than worship unto God. Uh, whether it causes us not to be generous or even use our own body for money, just flat out compromising our godly morals for money is a real temptation in many ways in this life. And we're told as believers not to embrace the doctrine of Balaam. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, or that word could be translated mammon, the God of money. When we compromise in this area and live for money, or mammon, it will affect our relationship with God. It's going to pull us a different way. We shouldn't be unequally yoked. We need to make a decision not to compromise our faith in this way. And this is why I think tithing is absolutely genius and so freeing and such a loving command and wisdom from the Lord to us. Because when we tithe, give 10% of our income, it's something that reminds us that God is constantly in the first place, that He's in control. It shows His faithfulness and it shows us that, that He is better than money. You know, Proverbs 3, 9 tells us that we're to honor the Lord with wealth, with our finances, and with the first fruits of all of our produce. When we tithe and give 10% of everything that we earn or everything that we receive, we set a precedent that Jesus is more important than money. He's more important than status, than power, than mammon, what money these things can buy. Jesus satisfies, and we constantly are able to worship God with money because we need money in this life to live. And so Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Meaning it gives us something to actually physically do to free us from the God of money, to worship God with money. See how beautiful it is? Jesus redeems. Giving to Jesus as worship breaks us from the tyranny of the false God of mammon. And when we are actually acknowledging God in this way, man, we're, we're saying it's not about our efforts, it's not about our gold, it's not about our money. These things don't build me up. Worshiping God builds me up. But this church, sadly, it was compromising. It was settling and taking earthly treasure, just like Balak, worshiping Balaam. And this compromise of Balaam wasn't just about greed and money, it was also uh, had this compromise of sexual immorality. Now, one commentator said the worship of these pagan deities was usually marked by the most abominable practices. The pagan temples had priests who were actually prostitutes, and the revenues for, the mo for most of the pagan temples was uh, gained through prostitution. Part of their religious involvement or rites uh, involved sexual orgies with their priestesses. And so in this area of Asia, uh, minor at the time, Gnostics was a big deal and they were very prideful and they were very influenced. They said, uh, Gnostic would say, listen, everything material is evil. God doesn't even care about your, your body. Their belief that what God had nothing to do with the material life, therefore it did not matter what you did with your body. They thought that you can just do anything you wanted. Uh, God or a God wasn't concerned with your evil body. He was only concerned with your spirit. Thus, therefore, there was all kinds of sexual perversion in their worship. 
And the Bible actually teaches against this, that we are not just spiritual, but we are physical. We're going to get resurrected bodies, and God is concerned of our sexual purity, what we do with our body, because the Holy Spirit dwells with us and in us. And we're warned as believers to walk in sexual purity, to not fall in temptation of sexual immorality. Uh, you know, First Peter chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, it says this, Live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, right? We don't give into the flesh. We don't live for our body, but it is important how we use our bodies, a living sacrifice unto the Lord. And for the will of God, Peter says, for the time that is past suffices for what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Paul would warn us of this, sexual purity. 1 Thessalonians 4, 2-5 through 5, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you would abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. In fact, sexual immorality is warned against in almost every single book of the New Testament. And yet many of us, right, we walk and are tempted with sexual sin to compromise in this area, in this age today. And we need to ask God for help and we need to pray. Sexual immorality includes anything outside of sex between a married man and a married woman. This would include sex outside of marriage. This would include pornography. This would include homosexuality. Anything outside of the covenant of a man and a woman, husband and wife, would be sexual morality. And there is a great temptation and compromise in our culture today to give in to the lust of the flesh. And the Bible says we are not to compromise in our believing that God is concerned about our entire life. And remember, what we believe affects our behavior. And so the Lord in His loving grace is, is actually giving them a rebuke to tell them, don't give your body over to these things. Don't fall into the trap. This is exactly what was happening in this compromised church. This was a problem. Now, the last problem we see this church embrace was this brace of another doctrine, the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Uh, now, what began as a doctrine in one church, Ephesus, remember they had rebuked this doctrine, uh, now was actually embraced in this other church. Uh, it was this idea divided by priest and laity, a different class system, oppression or superiority thinking. Uh, this doctrine was the idea that there was hierarchy or a class system. But we know this isn't to be found in the church. G Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. Uh, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither fail, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but doesn't just your heart break when you think about the racism going on right now? The segregation, the oppression. It's terrible and it's not of God. This is not something that the Lord teaches. He loves all people, and we are all one under His grace. We all need the grace of God. We're all made in His image, and we're all to be used by God in the family of God. For Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We were called to serve and to follow the Lord and have all access to the Spirit of God and to walk in His ways. But they had braced the idea of superiority in leadership and abuse of power. This was the practice of putting others down to lift yourself up. The abuse of status and the gifts of God that God gave by grace that you would put others down and oppress people. And Peter warns church leaders of this type of leadership, of this type of demonic oppression. He says, Do not be domineering over those that you were in charge, but be examples to the flock. First Peter five three. Peter warns husbands not to act in this way. Peter, to, uh, Paul tells husbands to love your wives. You have authority or responsibility. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up. Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter eighteen verse one through four. Jesus would say that those that want to be great in the kingdom, or you want to have some some status in the kingdom, well then you serve, you love, you care. We are to love God and to love others. These are the greatest commands. This is what we're told to do. 
And when we are given certain graces or privileges or status or power or authority, we are to use it for God's glory, not our own, but to serve and to love. But this church embraced this doctrine and compromised in what God taught them. And you know what? They were getting rebuked. They were getting told. They were said there were going to be a price to pay. When we compromise from the Word of God, we also start to practice crazy, unbiblical things. Right? And so this is why we need to have God's Word to guide us and not our culture, not our environment, not even our emotions of what we think and our opinion. We need to listen to God and His authority and how we live our lives. Or we're going to fall into the trap uh, of these false doctrines, uh, worshiping uh, mammon and, and, and oppression and, and even compromising and giving in to Satan's lies. This is the, the foundation that we're to build our lives on is God's Word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, to the joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See, we'll be tossed to and fro by false doctrines of the world as we, if we don't embrace the Word of God. And this is why in every letter God gives them the problem, but also the answer. He says, I'm the answer. And so he addresses this letter in verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum writes, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. He gives us the answer. He says, listen, the sword is a symbol and representation of the Word of God. We need God's Word to clarify in how we're to walk and how we're to live. If not, we're going to have a problem. Because we live in this world where Satan is just around the corner. He's trying to seek us and deceive us and lie. And there's false doctrine out there. But I'm giving you the answer. I'm giving you my Word. And the Bible even says that God is the living Word. Verses that come to mind are like 1 John 4, 1, where we're to test all spirits by the Word of God. Our 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, how the Holy Spirit has inspired the Word of God to correct us, to rebuke us, to train us in righteousness, that we would walk in the ways of God. One commentator said, The Word of God has the ability to separate believers from the world and to condemn the world for its sin. It was the Word of salvation as well as the Word of death. The Word of God is the final authority, and it is powerful. And we're not only to go to God's Word, but the living Word, Jesus Himself. He gives Him the title of the, the two-edged sword, the Word. We're to fix our eyes on His glory, so the things and the treasures of this earth are to be dim, and not to compromise, and not to look in these little, little gods and little false idols, but look to the true God, Jesus the King. I like what Chuck Swindoll says, he says, like a cancerous tumor that spreads through healthy flesh, compromise allows falsehood to strangle the truth, ultimately destroying it. Only a sharp scalpel in the hands of a precise surgeon can remove the cancer without killing the patient. Christ, the great physician, is qualified not only to diagnose, but also to successfully treat the indecidious disease of compromise. See, when we cling to Jesus and His Word, we're able to actually have an anchor for our soul and not to drift and actually be able to enjoy the benefits of walking with God and not be two-faced, not compromised, but be whole and satisfied. And so Christ gives them encouragement or counsel, and He gives this counsel to you and to me to cling to Him and to His Word, to practice in His ways. Verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone, and with a new name written on it, the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. God says, I, I, I have this answer for you. I will give you great manna. The idea of manna is bread falling from heaven. Jesus is the bread of life. And we, in the Old Testament, God gave the people of Israel manna, bread from heaven, to sustain them daily. They were to go and take it and to partake and to live. And we're to partake in Jesus, the living word, and His word to live and be strengthened every single day, to feed our souls, to strengthen our spirit. This is the daily abiding in Christ and loving and uh, receiving His Word in our life. And he says that there is great reward for going to God for truth and not compromising. He mentions this white stone. 
Okay, there's hidden man and I will give you a white stone with a new name written on it, the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. It's this special privilege, this special intimacy between you and God, this white stone. Now, some suggest that the white stone actually had to do of acceptance and approval in the voting process of the time. Uh, a white stone signifies a yes, a black stone signifies a no. And so by receiving a white stone from Jesus, the great reward is that you would please him. That, that he would get acceptance. You know, it pleases God when we accept his word and receive it and apply it. What a cool thing to think about that as followers of God, we can actually please him by abiding in his word and trusting in him. And he is pleased by our faith, Hebrews tells us. Another thought of this white stone could be a ticket to a banquet. Uh, it would be like a sign of friendship or evidence that you've been counted or a sign of acquittal in the court of the Jewish law. And Jesus may have had any one of these things or meetings in mind when he had said a white stone, but at the very least we know that it was an assurance of blessing, a quit, a account, a ticket. It was a special gift to those who kept his word. And we know there is great blessing when we keep God's word. Now, what's the application for me and you from this church? Well, we need to build our life on Jesus' word. If we want to uh, not be tempted and if we want to actually remain strong through the winds and the storms, like Matthew 7, 24 through 27, those that will stand and those will last will build their life on the rock who is the solid foundation of Jesus Christ and his word. And so we need to build our lives off of God's Word. We need to know God's Word. We need to read God's Word. We need to study God's Word like this. This is actually important that we're coming together under God's authority as a church and taking time okay, to study God's Word. This builds your life and it will have great fruit. So we must understand that the devil is real and he tempts us, and he lies, and he deceives us. So we need God's word to give us discernment, like Hebrews 4.12 says. I like what Brian Broderson says about the word of God. Christians cannot live victoriously when disconnected from the word of God. Let me ask you, are you disconnected from God's word? Have you been this week? Are you disconnected from God, the living word? Do you even know Jesus and have a relationship with him? Here's the great news in the gospel of this. Jesus was speaking truth and ministering to him like he speaks truth and ministers to you and me. He gives us himself and today we can depend and turn to him and find salvation and life. In a world of compromise, Jesus is the answer. And as we go to his word, it draws us to him. I'll close with this quote from A.W. Tozer. It says, The Bible is not an end in itself but a means to bring men to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God, that they may enter into Him, and they may delight in His presence, may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God Himself in the core and center of their hearts. What a privilege it is to study God's Word, to have intimacy with Him, and to enjoy Him. And that's what we're going to do together now, is to have a time of communion, singing, praising God, and just meditating on His truths. Let's pray. And let's continue to lean in what all the Spirit wants to teach us in this moment. God, we thank you so much that we can turn to you, that we can partake in communion, God, that we can eat of your flesh and drink of your blood, Lord. We need to partake in your grace. You died for all of our sins. Lord, in our compromise, you died for it. There is no condemnation in you where the enemy wants to condemn and lie and cause us and say that we cannot have victory, Lord. We know that we can have victory in you, Lord. And so we thank you for your word, your promises of salvation. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you in this moment. And we do right now corporately, Lord, wherever we're at, Lord, we know that we are connected together as a church family. God, we know that we are connected together by the blood of Jesus and your grace. And I just pray, God, for those that are watching this that may not know you, that they would repent today, that they wouldn't compromise by just living after their emotion or going for the culture, but they would go to you, the living word, and put their faith in you. And if that is you right now, you just ask Jesus right now to forgive you of your sin, to, to just come into your life. You just repent and he will place his Holy Spirit inside of you and you could be the pure, clean and white temple that, you, uh, that he so desires and wants you to be. Jesus died for us all, and we thank you so much, Jesus, for that. We thank you so much that your word says if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, we will be saved. 
Lord, we, we just we rebuke the enemy in his lives. We rebuke the demonic power and the temptation, God. We ask, Lord, that you would deliver us from the evil one and we would find our victory in you. And so now, God, we go to you in worship. We come to your altar. We come to you as a living sacrifice. Let us sing these praises and make them prayers, God, and let us come to you and find a celebration and joy in partaking in your sacrifice and your love that was demonstrated for us on the cross. It's in your name we pray, God. Amen.
Yeah, now we want to uh, prepare our hearts as we come before the Lord uh, to take communion together. And so as we've been studying these seven churches, and we've only made it through a few of them so far, um, there's a reoccurring theme here. Uh, God continues to tell the churches, you're doing great in this, but you're lacking in this. You're doing great over here and you're lacking over here. And when I think of that, I just think that when, when we allow things to come into our lives or when we omit things that God has called us to, we're missing something that God has for us. And so in John 10:10, 10, 10, the Lord said that, um, I have come to give you life and life abundantly. And I think that one of the things that we miss when we start admitting things like some of these churches did, or when we allow the world to come into the church, some of the things that we miss is that abundant life that God has called us to, that, that abundancy of joy. I recently heard a pastor saying that um, happiness is based on happenings, what's going on around you. And the Bible right before Jesus says that he has come to give us life and life abundantly the scripture actually says the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I have come to give you life. And so while the enemy may want to try to steal our joy, really the only thing he can do is disrupt our happiness because of the happenings. And so the scripture says that, um, that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And if God is in us, His Holy Spirit has given us these fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And you can see that that joy that we desire, and maybe the inner enemies disrupted your happiness during this pandemic, but He can't take your joy away. And as believers, we need to remember that. But I do believe that we miss some of that blessing from God when we allow things to come into our lives. So as we prepare our hearts during this next song for worship, I would just ask you, take a few moments. Ask God, search my heart. Show me where I've allowed things to come in or where maybe I'm leaving things out, holding on to things that I don't need to hold on to, trying to take too much control of my own life, whatever it is, whatever it is that we may be able to receive that joy and that abundant life that he's called us to. So let's meditate on the Lord during this next song and prepare our hearts for taking communion together and celebrating the work that he's done for us on the cross. Let's worship.
Pray that that, um, that time of worship really ministered to your heart and that God spoke to you through that. So as we get our elements together, our crackers and our juice, and um, we begin to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper. And I think about that word celebrate. And we always do this with a, a, a seriousness, which we should, but we also have to remember that it's a celebration because our Savior is not hanging on a cross anymore. He rose from the dead. And that is one of the things we remember the sacrifice that he made for us in communion. But we also celebrate the fact that he has victory over death and that we can have new life in him. And that's what we're celebrating this morning as we take the cracker and as we take the juice representing his body and his blood. The Apostle Paul says um, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that the night that the, that the Lord came together with his disciples, uh, he took the bread and he prayed over it and he took the juice and he prayed over it and he said, this is my body and this is my blood which I have shed for you. And in this blood, this is the new covenant. He, he sealed that new covenant with his blood to give us this new life. So as we take the cracker and the juice together, we're gonna to pray over it first, and then let's take it all together in celebration of what the Lord has done. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your body on the cross. Lord, we thank you for your blood in the new covenant. Lord, we thank you for who you are and the way that you have redeemed our lives. Lord, we thank you that you called us to this in celebration, in memory of who you are and what you've done for us in memory of your victory, not just your death, Lord. So we thank you, Jesus. We love you, we praise you, and we worship you this morning together as we take the, the bread and the juice. You may take the bread and the juice. And the scripture said, then they sang a song now I'm not going to sing a song for you because I want you to hang out a little bit and let us finish the service together. So, um, but they did sing a song. They rejoiced. So right there where you're at at your house, if you want to rejoice and sing a hymn, that's awesome. I encourage you to do that. But they did sing a song as they went out of that room and they went off to prepare the Lord uh, for those last days. And we should celebrate. We should sing songs and, and hymns as we celebrate the things that the Lord has done. So uh, let's pray together and um, let's close our service out and continue to worship the Lord throughout the rest of our day and week. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. Uh, Lord, we praise you for the service today. Lord, we praise you for communion, for the memory. Lord, we praise you for everything that you've done, Lord. We praise you for these things that we have, um, like the, our phones, even the technology, that we have to be able to stay connected, to watch these services, to continue to do church in spite of lockdowns. Lord, we do pray as a church and as a body of believers that um, you would open up the door for us to be able to meet together in your perfect timing. That's what we desire, Lord. You know all of us desire to be together, to worship you corporate, corporately, to raise our hands and sing hallelujah, Lord, but we desired your perfect timing because we know when we're in your presence, in your timing, that's where we will find the fullness of joy. So we do thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the things that you've taught us through this, Lord, and we just I pray that you would just continue ministering to our hearts. Lord, give us a great week this week. Lord, bless our church body. 
bless those that have joined us today that aren't a part of our body, that are just visiting, Lord. I just pray that just a special blessing over each and every person watching the service this morning. We love you, Lord. We praise you, and we give you all glory. In your name we pray. Amen. So be blessed, and have a great week. Amen.